Hey, what's happening everybody? Welcome to the channel. Got something a little bit different for you today, actually. Um, I recently found out that I was uh, telepathic and that I could speak to people across the world while riding a bike. Crazy. Absolutely mental. But yeah, it's true. True story. As you're about to find out. And I could speak to brothers across the world with the click of a hand. Mental. Absolutely crazy. So watch this. Motor of. I just hear some of that. That sounded like Jimmy Corkill. Must be hearing things. Maverick! Maverick! Are you there? No, no, no. Not that Maverick. The better looking model. The better looking version. Maverick! Are you there? Hold on a minute. I've just heard it again. My pack talks off, my phone's off. Hold on a minute. Is that you, military biker? <laughs> Happy days! See, I told you this telepathy thing works! <laughs> no swan, mate. Nobody believed me. Nobody believed me, mate, and, you know, that I'm telepathic and, and looks like you are as well. Crazy this, isn't it? I thought then, I thought I'm, I'm hearing voices in my head. Well, I'm glad you could, glad you could join me, mate. Glad you could, you know, I could talk to you whilst I'm out on a ride. And obviously while you're riding as well, mate. How is the wonderful country that is the UK? Yeah, mate, it's sound. Yeah, look at this. Hey, end of September, look at the weather. Beautiful. I mean, we're down to about 13 degrees at the minute. But no, it, um, all's good, mate. All's good here in the UK. Good, mate. That's glad. I'm glad to hear that. Jeez, I left, what, 20 years ago? And <laughs> I'd imagine there's been a lot of change since then. we still got this lockdown. Um, but no, apart from that, all is sweet. As it, as it over there in Canada, mate. Life is good, mate. Life is good out here in Canada. Uh, life is good. I can't complain too much, but I cannot complain. But anyway, listen. The reason I uh, telepathically rang you up is because I got a couple of questions, man, about that place that me and you both love, and that you've just come back from recently with the lads. The one and only Normandy in France. Mate, I watched that, I watched every single episode of that series, mate, and it was fantastic. Hello, France. Bonjour. <laughs> Bonjour. We're out. We're in France, boys. Oh. Karen Sand. Made it. Boy, shaka. We may. We may. You lads look like you had an amazing time. You really did. Was it was it good? Oh mate, tell you what, we had the time of our lives. Couldn't have picked a better tour with any better people. Awesome man, yeah, it looked it looked spectacular, mate. It really, really did. I was so jealous. I wish I could have joined you. Oh no mate. Oh I wish you could have been there, mate. I did mention you in the videos, I did. I really wish you could have been there. Would have been a would have been a blast, mate, having you on board. Yeah, there's always next time, mate. There's always next time. But listen, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions, like I said, about Normandy, mate, and about your Normandy trip. Okay, mate. Yeah, fire away. First one I'd like to add to ask is what was what was your motive motivation for going with the boys to Normandy? Why did you go? 
Oh, that's a good question, mate. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, why did we go? And what was our motivation? Well, last year, about this time last year, we was all discussing and we said, you know, we need to do a European tour. None of us had done a European tour before or been abroad on our bikes, apart from Alby and Escobar. They'd done Normandy last year. Obviously, Alby's been everywhere. And speaking with the other guys, you know, there, there's a bit of nerves, a bit of uncertainty. So I'll tell you what then. Why don't we do the closest to home? And obviously, the closest to home is Normandy. I said, let's do a little tour of Normandy. It's nice and close. Um, it'll give us some experience of being abroad, riding on the other side of the road. I said, you know, I said, we might enjoy it. I said, there might be a few things there to see. Everyone was up for it. Um, so obviously we started making plans. I then started to look at Normandy. I think, right, um, what can we do there? Obviously everybody's heard of Normandy and the D-Day landings. I was aware of it myself. Um, didn't have a, a great knowledge of it. But I thought, I'll do a little bit of research and let's find out what there is in Normandy. Let's get, let's get a couple of little stories. Because my idea was I wanted to try and make a video and a tour that was different to what everybody else was doing. Everybody kind of does the same thing. You know, there's loads of Normandy tour videos out there which are all good. You know, I did watch most of them, if not all, just to get some idea. I thought I want to try and I want to make this video something special and then obviously as I was learning more about Normandy and the stories and the sites and that there um, I started getting quite interested in it you know it was really really catching my attention you know it was blowing me away some of the stories and the things you could see there in the sites so I did more research. I then discovered Band of Brothers, watched Band of Brothers, and then once I'd watched Band of Brothers, I thought, this is amazing. Properly got me hooked. Um, and then I didn't realize, but the place we booked to stay was literally right in the middle, right by Carantan, which was one of the main battle scenes in um, Band of Brothers. So I thought, well, the chances of that. And you know, obviously sending links to the guys, we should go here, we should go there, we should see this, this is what happened here, this is the story of this bit, and I was just getting way into it, way, and I thought, this is going to be a very, very special tour, this is, it's going to be very, very special. So I'd kind of planned in my head how I wanted the tour, basically, to come out on video. I had this vision of using the tour... Uh, some old footage, some old photographs. Um, but the main thing I wanted to capture was I knew, you know, obviously some of these places, and the places you go to, are the very sombre places. Now we like, you, you know, you've seen our videos before. We we like a laugh. So I thought it's going to be quite a quite a wide contrast of what we're going to experience, you know. We're going to be on our bikes having a laugh, having a banter, taking the, the mickey out of each other. And then we're going to arrive at a site what's going to be all serious and is where respect is due. And I thought I wanted to capture that. That was my main goal. I thought I wanted to capture the mood. And if I can get anybody else to, f to try and feel from our videos what we felt, then, you know, that I've made an absolute stonker of a video. So that really, mate, was our main reason, and it just evolved into something bigger than we thought it was going to be. Yeah, man, that's it. That's <laughs> can't complain that, mate. That's an outstanding reason. Brilliant. Really, really good, man. Really good. So while you were there, you obviously went to see some awesome places, man. I thought, you know, for those guys that haven't, haven't seen uh, the Normandy vlog. You went to with how many places did you visit? Which was your favourite out of the places that you did visit? What was the what was your favourite place to go? Oh, which was our favourite place and what place did, did we go? But what we kind of done with this tour, mate, is I knew there was going to be a lot to see. Um, we were we only had five days. Two days of that really were the travelling there on the ferries and that. So really, we only had 
two actual days of riding in Normandy. So I knew we was never gonna, you know, we was never gonna see everything. It was impossible for us to do it in two days without us properly taking it in. So me and LB discussed the sights and the scenes and I says, right, obviously being our first tour as well, I didn't want to put too much pressure on myself leading the ride being the first time abroad and you know too much pressure on the other guys so I said to Albert I said what we'll do we'll just take it easy we'll get there I said and each day we'll just say what let's pop here and then when we get to a certain destination we'll look what's on the map next and we'll say right let's go here so that was kind of what we did and the places which took it I mean everywhere was unique in its own it's own individual right you know every, everywhere was special the places what really stuck out to me was the german cemetery got me that really did get me that did um i found the place very oh, it's hard to explain it it really brought it home like you know it, i felt a lot of sorrow and and it's funny because when i was there i felt I felt remorse as well, and it's, it's very, 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 very hard to explain it. What I was feeling, um, and you know, and you think, which we said in the video, and a lot of people have, have mentioned, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these soldiers, it was you fight or you die. They had no option, you know. Yeah, there was, there were some very, very nasty, evil people in the German army, very nasty, evil, but. A lot of these soldiers, what was on the front, you know, they, they, they didn't want to be there. They were the same as us. They had family at home, you know, it was... A lot of them didn't believe in the cause I was fighting. It was just something, that, you know, they had to do. But yeah, that was um, very special. And that picture as well, that picture's always... I put this picture up recently on Instagram. A photograph of a young kid. I mean, he, he is a kid. A German soldier in a trench, you know, and he's absolutely petrified, he's crying and he's peed his pants and next to him is another German soldier shouting at him probably telling him to you know get up stand up and fight now that picture really touched me when I saw that picture you know I really did think you know these were they were like us they were kids you know and what you're led to believe is the enemy is not really the true case is it but yeah German temperature mate and I know the one the big beach everyone talks about is Omaha Beach, but once that stood out for me was Utah Beach. And I think that's because it was the first beach we went to, it was the first one was Utah Beach. And, you know, we kind of, the first time I got to see the shore, you know, the sand, Get the sea, the so all these, where all these lives passed and perished. Oh, I'll tell you what, there was, was another place as well we went to, um, which is not quite a well-known story, actually. Not a lot of people have heard of it, was Grainez. We went to Grainez, which was um, a little village, a tiny little village just up the road from where we were staying. And again, I found this by pure coincidence on YouTube. The the uh, but after the re a lot of research I tried doing and looking on the internet, there's not a lot actually mentioned about the, the place. And it's a tiny little church. Um, where some of the American paratroopers you know, landed in the wrong place and ended up there and then obviously the Germans come in and massacred everyone in the town. That was a, that was a really, really strange place that was. And obviously they burnt down the church and the church was just kept there as a memorial. So that was our, that was the very first site we went to see that was. So that was, a, that was quite, quite a unique one. What, what did it feel like? When you went on to Normandy, when you went to Normandy, and you went to the beaches and stuff like that, could you? You went to home, Omaha Beach. What was it? What would it feel like to be sat or stood on that beach where all those guys died, you know, uh, seventy odd years ago, put their lives at risk to for the the world that we live in now? You know, what what did it feel like, mate, standing there looking out amongst that? Well, that was. Uh... That was an amazing, amazing experience that was standing on the beach. I mean, to stand there and just look round. I mean, I looked down the coastline and 
you know, it's it's phenomenal how big that Normandy beachfront is. You know, it's it's not like when you go to Weymouth or somewhere, or you know, you see the little beachfront, and from one end of the beach you can see right down to the other. This was this was monstrous. This beach, absolutely monstrous. And yeah, it was um, it really got me. I mean, when I got to Utah, I just wanted to kind of touch the sand and I did I, you know I got some sand and I, I let the sand run through my through my fingers it was a very 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 special moment and I wanted the biggest thing I wanted to do was I wanted to touch the sea I wanted to feel the sea on my hands and my feet you know these those waves have a million stories to tell Know, all those souls and and memories and lives what got washed washed out it was very that was an important thing to me that was I wanted I wanted to feel the water you know I wanted to feel you know their presence were there I could feel you know you could it's strange to say you know I'm not a religious person or anything like that but you know it's a very 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 strange, unique place to explain. You know, you, you feel you do, you feel it, you feel the sorrow. You know, you feel you feel the peace. One thing which did stand out in my mind was when we went to the American cemetery. I mean, that place is that's unbelievable. The amount of crosses there. Uh, the only thing I found with the American cemetery was it was very. It was very tourist. You know, it did feel tourist and. I know, I know, and at the end of the day, we were there being two it's but you know, I just thought, I thought they deserved more respect than it being a two recite. It's a bit of an odd one. Um, but the strange thing I felt at the American cemetery is I didn't feel sad or sorrow there. It was quite, quite unusual. There, I had an overwhelming, overwhelming sense of peace. I felt peace. You know, and I think, you know, whether it was all these souls or whatever they were, you know, all these soldiers were, you know, I could feel they, they were at peace. And I sensed, I sensed that in the atmosphere. Do you, do you, do you regret not going into Dead Man's Corner Museum? Because that was my favourite place, that, when, I, when I went to Normandy, that was my, uh, probably the favourite place that I, I visited, mate. And it, it was an absolute blast being in there. I know you guys were getting rained on, you couldn't park because it was way busy. Um, but you know, do you, do you regret not going into Dead Man's Corner Museum or the D-Day experience, as it's called? Dead Man's Corner. Now, actually, there, there is a story behind this Dead Man's Corner. Um, for one, I'd, I'd I knew you'd done it on your channel, but I had completely forgot about it. Dead Man's Corner. I never even put it on the list. Um, so yeah, we we was going we were going somewhere. We went past it, and I think you hear me on the video say, "Oh, there's Dead Man's Corner." Uh, and then on the way back, I said, you know, we'll pop in. But the strangest thing, what we found, and I don't know whether this was to do with, obviously, you know, coronavirus or anything like that, but everywhere shut at 7.30. We couldn't find anything. Any shops open, supermarkets, even petrol stations, we couldn't find. So it was on our way back. We got to Dead Man's Corner. It started raining, and... You know, we were desperately looking, desperately trying to find some shops, and we wanted to go in, and I said to the guy, I think at this point, it was already about seven o'clock, and I said, look guys, you know, I said, we ain't got time to go in, let's just get a quick photo outside, in front of the tanks, and then, you know, we've got to move on, so, in one way, we did, we did miss out at Dead Band's Corner, which was a shame, because I would like to have seen that, I bet that would have been fantastic. But anyway, I know you did it on your video, didn't you? And, you know, watching your video, I got to see it. So what did you think of the, uh, the gun battery at Long Sumer? Long Sumer, Sur Mer. I don't know how the French call it, but that's how I call it, Long Sumer. What do you think of the gun battery there, man? Because I, I, mate, that was, that's one of my favourite sites. You know, the guns are still there. Uh, one of the guns is actually in the floor, or half in the floor, as you've seen. Uh, and obviously the other half is uh, bombed out. But yeah, the, the Navy absolutely wrecked that place. 
you know, but what's left is is phenomenal, mate. And it, you know the the lookout position from the longest day, the, from the film, the longest day. That's where they film that. Um, and just the guns in general, man. What do you think about that? Wow, those guns! Whoa, they were amazing, weren't they, mate? You imagine them belting at you. <laughs> Jesus Christ! You know, I bet you'd never forget the sound of them. Oh, they were superb. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed that place. That was amazing, that was. And getting to go in that uh, that bunker right at the front where the machine gun post would have been looking out. And, you know, you got a view, didn't you? Right over the, right over the sea to where they would have been shooting. That was amazing, that was. Loved that place. Really, really good. So, last question, bud, if you won't mind. You know, we're doing this whole telepathy question and thing. What will be your last memory of Normandy? What will be my last memory? I think, bring it back with me, is, you know, it was our first tour. Well, Thank you. Please. It was our first tour. I don't think we could have picked any better tour for our first one. It was with great company. Um, the feelings we had there, you know, the emotional roller coaster we had. Um, you know, it was, it's a, a place I really want to go back and finish seeing all the other parts of it to be honest about because I mean there was so much we didn't get to see we didn't get to see any of the British beaches any of the Canadian you know and I really would like to have seen a lot more I really would so anyhow mate um, I'll ask you a few questions then if that's alright with you pal but you know I'll make this into a, a tiny little interview is that alright with you? yeah yeah man of course <laughs> Wouldn't be much of a dual vlog, mate, if you didn't ask, you know, ask me some questions like I asked you questions at the end of the day, mate, eh? <laughs> okay then, mate, so we all knew you originally as Scouse Adventures. So, for those that don't already know, could you just explain to everybody why have you changed your channel name to The Military Biker? So, yeah, so the reason I changed the channel name, bud, um, was... As you know, but your viewers may not, uh, I am a British soldier living in Canada. Based in Canada, now living here, blah, blah, blah. So, not many people uh, over here knew what a Scouser was, for obvious reasons, right? So, I obviously named the channel Scouts Adventures before, many, many moons ago, right? Before we came here. So, uh, 90% I figured out through the Google uh, sorry the YouTube analytics that 90% of my traffic uh, coming to the channel was, was from the States um, but they weren't really you know uh, this could be for other reasons obviously but um, you know they were coming hanging around watching the videos but not subscribing and, and I don't know people were asking me what's a scouser and what why what does your name mean and all that stuff so in the end I thought well I think personally that the channel would grow better over here, considering 90% of my traffic uh, comes from the from the north uh, North America. That if I change it to the military biker or the military biker as they call it over here, um, I'd get a lot more views. People would understand what the channel was about, uh, and obviously, you know, I'd get the the, the vets from the states, the servant soldiers from the states vets from Canada, servant soldiers from Canada, so on and so forth, so, um, and if I'm honest, it's gone up, uh, it's worked so far, I'm getting a lot more traffic coming to the channel, uh, YouTube is pumping a lot more people my way, my subscribers have gone up uh, quite a bit since I changed the name, people that would uh, ordinarily not comment on my videos are now starting to comment on the videos, so it, I think it's worked me, so, nah, as Borat would say, or nice, I like. So yeah, so it worked. So that's why I changed it, mate. That's why I changed it. And you've also got a second YouTube channel, haven't you? World War Diggers. Now I've watched this and they're absolutely fantastic, but do you want to just explain to the viewers about your other channel, World War Diggers? Or what kind of things happen on there? And I'll put a link up actually to your other channel. And yeah, you're right, I do have a, uh, yeah, I do have another channel. It's called World War Diggers, as you alluded to there. Uh, that was from uh, my 
World War II digging days in Germany. I spent 18 years with the army in Germany. Um, I was quite lucky because, to be fair, for the last 24 years I've been in the army. Um, I've spent two years out of those 24 years living in the UK. So, like I said, 18 years in Germany and the rest of the time has been spent over here. Uh, apart from a two year stint in the UK. So, uh, I'm a mad World War II freak. I love everything World War II. Uh, I collect all sorts of different militaria. Uh, but whilst I was in Germany, I collected a hell of a lot of, of uh, let's call it what it is, Nazi memorabilia. Um, I'm not a Nazi in any way, shape or form. I just love that era and, and you know, getting hold of that stuff out there once you knew the right people was pretty easy, if I'm honest. Um, so the World War Diggers channel came about by one Christmas, the missus bought me a, uh, a metal detector uh, for Christmas, like I said, but um, being in December, uh, being December in Germany, it was pretty, pretty cold and the first day I got it, I was out Boxing Day digging up an old POW camp, which was attached to our camp um, where I was based in Fallenbostel in Germany, oh, bad Fallenbostel as it's called now. Um, and I found I found a bloody hell of a lot of stuff from buttons, you know, from from the GIs, from American GIs, from buttons. I found French buttons. I found German buttons. Um, I found all sorts. And obviously, as as time went on, I got used to it. Got used to the detector, um, and I, I used to be able to set it up correctly for you know finding the good stuff and not the shit. Because let's be honest, I found a lot of shit. Just you know, rust, rusted out stuff that you didn't even have a clue what it was. Um, so I trained myself, and I trained to, I, I learned how to use the detector properly. Um, and you know, the fruits of the fruits of it are, are on the channel. Um, there's just all sorts. <laughs> you know, I found Jesus. I found everything from from buttons to guns to German helmets to bloody all sorts. Absolutely all sorts. It, it's all on the channel. You know, you have to, you guys have to go and check check it out. Um, but yeah. That's why I, I had the I had the World War Diggers channel for bloody years and years while I was over there. Um, but at one point somebody hacked into it, so I had to delete all my content uh, and start again. Which I think I started the channel again about two years ago, uh, using all the old content, just reloading it and re revamping it slightly with different um, thumbnails and what have you. But yeah, man, that's that's the World War Diggers channel. Uh, it's pretty good. Goes pretty good. They go with my normally stuffs on there, my digging stuffs on there. So yeah. So you've visited Normandy as well yourself and vlogged it before. Uh, I've watched your videos, which were amazing. So obviously for us doing it as a civilian, you know, we, we try to understand what it must have felt like and imagine it. But obviously you being an active soldier and who've been, you know, in war conditions, what was it, what was that like for you going to see? Because obviously you'd understand what it was like for these guys and you know, what, what does it feel like when you're faced with that? Yeah, mate, I've visited Normandy a few times um, and if I'm honest, it's probably one of my favourite places to go um, just, just because of the history and stuff like, you know, and I'm, like being a mad World War II freak like I am um, Sorry, that was bloody train Yeah, man, bro uh, Yeah, Normandy is, is sort of a place that I could see myself settling if I wasn't living in Canada and settling in Canada I could definitely see myself settling in Normandy um, the history aside the place is absolutely gorgeous uh, as you've seen you know it's it's a beautiful beautiful place um, just a shame that so much death and, and destruction happened there um, but yeah so seeing it from the, the point of a, of a squad you mate or a soldier is is quite interesting for, for me anyway you know for, for thinking about uh, the tactical side of life and you know how I would do things and if I was in charge of a squadron or a, a section of lads or whatever I mean being a tank soldier uh, we would have rolled up onto the beach if our um, D-Day funnies uh, Hobart's funnies as they were called the, the sort of the thing that went round the, uh, the round the tank to stop them from sinking or try and stop them from sinking some of them did um, so that would have been me you know in the tank in the Sherman or in the Centurion or uh, not the Centurion, bloody hell, way before that. Uh, in the Sherman or the Conqueror or anything like that, you know, going the Churchill uh, and and seeing, you know, how how the tanks would have first of all got off the beach to begin with, with all the Panzerfaust, the artillery and and everything like that that was the you know that was coming in at them. 
uh, not just the tanks, everybody that came off the beach, um, or beaches, should I say. So yeah, I look at it from a tactical point of view, and like I said, how I would have done things, and it's just, I don't know, you know when you see something that's alive, that happened thousands of thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, 20 years ago, 75 years ago, you know, you, you see it, and you, for me, I could hear, it may sound strange, but I could hear the gunshots, I could see the lads, I could hear, you know, everything, the, the pain, the blood, the guts, the everything that would have been going on at that time. Um, I could see it because I've been through something similar to that. Not in any way, shape or form as bad as that. Nowhere near jumping onto a beach and doing and landing on D-Day. Um, but, you know, getting shot at and stuff like that, I've experienced that. So I can imagine... I can only imagine what those young lads were going through at the time, you know, and being when I first experienced something like that, like I said, not nowhere anywhere near, I can't put it into comparison like that, um, but when I first experienced getting shot at, if I'm honest, I was scared to death. I absolutely was white as a sheet. Now, if anybody tells you otherwise, that's had that experience, the, the lion, <laughs> I'm sorry, but... <laughs> so I can only imagine those young lads who had, you know, been told, oh, you might be going, you might not be going, you might be going, you might not be going. To be then told, right, you're on the ship, let's go, and then for it to be turned around halfway across the channel, and then go again on the 6th of June. Um, to be, you know, in, in those landing craft as they've been disembarked from the main ships, and then just literally stacked together like sardines, and, you know, knowing as soon as that door drops on that, on that landing ship, on the, you know, the... What the hell were they called? The landing boat, let's call them that. Um, you know, knowing that there's a German guy, a well-trained German at the end of an MG42, which had the biggest, the, the, the fastest firing rate at that time out of any machine gun. Um, you know, it could fire a lot of rounds in a minute compared to anything that the Allies had. So, you know, a young lad absolutely cacking his pants, wondering whether he was going to even get off the ship and off the boat of the landing craft most of them didn't as soon as that door went down you've seen private everybody's seen private ryan as soon as the door goes down and if they start getting hammered by the, the german rounds coming in that's not that's not made up man that is actual fact that's what happened some of those lads didn't even step foot onto french soil and they were mowed down or they were taken out by a, a, you know an artillery piece in the middle of the sea in the middle of the channel it, it's just i couldn't imagine mate that, the the fear, you know, and the, and the trepidation that those lads would have had at that time, you know, on, on June 6, 1944. And let's not forget, Erwin Rommel, who was in charge of the Atlantic Wall defences, and especially in Normandy, was away. He was away back in Berlin. I think it was his wife's birthday, I believe. And he wasn't even on the front line. So, by the time that the Germans realised what had happened, uh, it was, you know, they're trying to get all the Rommel to say, right, what do we do? Uh, he wasn't contactable. Nobody would wake Adolf Hitler up. Nobody. Well, we don't want to wake him up, but, you know, they thought it was a, um, a false attack. Or a fake attack. But nobody would wake Hitler up. Erwin Rommel, who was the commander of the, of the, uh, the defences, was back in Berlin. So nobody, the German... Could you imagine if Rommel was there? Or if Hitler had been woken up a little bit earlier, or just, you know, at the day, on that time that they first spotted the Allied ships coming across, the Armada coming across, you know, what the, what the lads would have faced if they were facing a hell of a lot more organised and stronger army in the Germans. There could have been way more worse casualties than what there were, or what there was, sorry. So, yeah, just imagine if they were a little bit more... I think the, you know, the casualties would have been a thousand times worse than what they were. So from, from my point of view, mate, I just look at it as a battlefield and I can, you know, I can totally get what, you know, those lads went through and I can see from both sides, you know, I can see the defences and I can see the offences as well, you know, those attacking uh, and stuff like that, but yeah, just scary stuff, man, scary stuff, especially because the technology that we have nowadays against the technology they had back then, I mean, for me, as a tank soldier, I'm in a Challenger 2 main battle tank most of my time, which is probably one of the hardest tanks to defeat in the world. Uh, and the lads had, let's for instance, the Sherman, which the Germans called the Tommy Cooker, because literally it would go on fire. 
you've, you've seen uh, if you've seen Fury, you'll know exactly what I mean about the Shermans going on fire. Because they were petrol, they just go up like that. You know, one one wrong uh, one wrongly placed or rightly placed if you're on the German side, round going into that would set it completely, blow it up and it go on fire. It wasn't very well uh, thought of, if I'm honest with it, with the old petrol engine. But yeah, so just fear mate really with the I would imagine what most of those boys had. And could you imagine the lads from World War One, the bloke suit, fought because they were in World War One and then had to go and land on the Normandy beaches in 1944. Could you imagine what they were thinking? They're the old sweats. They are, I've done this before. Well, I've done a deep slander before, but I was in the trenches in in uh, Belgium and France, you know, and, and then they had to go. They were still in the army at that point, probably, uh, and had to go and fight another war, two wars, two of the biggest world wars ever, and then they had to go and storm the beach. Crazy. So what's been the best war site visit you've done? What's the best place you've been? Ooh, that's a good question and a tough question, mate, that one. Uh, oh. Normandy will always, you know, will always, you can't beat Normandy, man, for what's, you know, what's left behind and the museums and everything like that. So, and the fact that you can walk in the footsteps of of all those uh, soldiers that not only gave their lives but gave their freedom away and stuff, you know. So, not, to me, the best place is and always will be Normandy, just for that sole reason. But I have to say, when I went to uh, Auschwitz in Poland, um, you know, probably the biggest concentration camp or the most famous concentration camp that the Germans set up, uh, that was something else just seeing the you know the industrial scale of the murder that went on there um, and you know you could you look at the buildings you look at this you look at that and, and it doesn't hit home until you get to two rooms but I think it's about three or two uh, three or four rooms where there's glasses that they took off people you know normal reading glasses seeing glasses and I am not kidding you, it's probably a football sized penalty box sized room stacked from top to bottom with glasses, just glasses. And in the next room, shoes, the same size. We're talking an 18 yard box on a football pitch, full to the brim, and you know, 18 yards square box by about maybe 12 to 14 foot in height just full of glasses and in the next one just full of shoes shoes that they've taken off these people to then kill them you know there's, there's baby shoes in there like this big to, to bloke shoes size 10 11 12 whatever and then you go to the next room and it's the same size room again just full of people's cases bags that they, you know, because they were all told that if they're going for resettlement, uh, bring what you can, but you can only have a certain amount of bags. Um, so leave everything else behind and just fill a couple of suitcases. And to see those people's names on the suitcases in these rooms, you know, it, it sort of hits home the the, the industrial scale that was uh, the gas chambers at Auschwitz. You know, they'd get off the train. It'd be split, women and children one way, men over there, then it'd be split again into workers and non-workers. So women and children, or women with children, were classed as not workers. So they were led literally straight to the, straight to the gas chamber with inside 15 minutes of being at Auschwitz or arriving at Auschwitz. The blokes were then split up uh, into two old blokes who couldn't work or young blokes who had disabilities who couldn't work and then blokes who could work you know because they wanted them to do to make stuff for the for the Reich for the third Reich you know so but again but those lads that were, were too either too old or too disabled or couldn't work for whatever reason were literally inside a gas chamber within 15 minutes of arriving in Auschwitz and gone 
And the worst bit about the people who could work is some of them were used, they were called the Zonda Commando. They were used to collect the bodies from inside the chambers after they'd been gassed by the Zyklon B. Um, which is what the Germans used to kill the people, was, was Zyklon B, it was called. Uh, and basically these guys who were, stop, I'm going to say, let live to work, um, had to go in afterwards and take all these women and children out and the blokes uh, and you know put them into the ovens for for crematorium type ovens for you know for for burning the, the, them down to, to ashes and stuff um, so could you imagine getting off the train you know and then you you've been right you can work mate you can go you can be part of this you can be part of the zonda commando you can now go and uh, collect all these bodies out of there once you've killed them uh, and could you imagine, you know, a, a, a train or two later or a week later, some of your family were in there. Could you imagine that? Having to take your family's bodies out of the gas chamber um, and then, you know, basically cremate them. Just blows your mind. It really does. Blows your mind. And while we're talking about Canada, well, you know, you guys know I'm in Canada. Um, in Auschwitz, there was a place called Canada. That's what the prisoners called this place because it was full of riches, it was full of gold teeth, it was full of all the stuff that the Germans thought that was valuable. And for whatever reason, you know, the prisoners called called it Canada because they thought Canada was, you know, full of riches and stuff. Um, and that part, seeing that part and seeing the stuff that, you know, the gold teeth, and it was just unbelievable, unbelievable. You know, the, the six million plus people had been brought to Auschwitz and they were dead, most of them dead within inside a week. It's just crazy, absolutely crazy. And when the Zonda Commando and the guys that work in Canada got two weeks to work, they just swapped them out. They would send them into the gas chambers. There you go, you're now dead. We can swap you out for somebody else. Absolutely crazy. So, yes, normally is the best place I've been uh, and my favorite place to go, but for eye-opening sheer shockness if that's a word of just unbelievable um, wow factor i would say that auschwitz was that if you ever get the chance to go mate you've got to go it's, it's something else and to be honest my missus did it as a surprise for me um, and when we got there it was liberation day liberation day of auschwitz um and there was survivors there were survivors there and i got to speak to this old bloke uh, me and the wife got to speak to this old guy who'd survived he was only a young lad at the time just a kid um and he got chosen to work in in canada the place in in auschwitz called canada because of his because he had tiny hands this is what he said to me because i had so small hands the germans used me to get into like the nooks and crannies of the cases that people had brought and stashed stuff in and the clothes and the, the neck linings around the shirts and stuff like that. That's what that poor young boy, I think he said he was eight, nine or ten, something like that, at the time when he was when he got you know told, right, you're now gonna be this guy who works in Canada. Could you imagine? My boys, my boys only just turned 12. Could you imagine the kids going through that and, and geez man, it's just just beggars belief. It honestly does beggars belief. But yeah. We were, we, we were lucky, we were lucky, you know, we got to go on, on uh, Liberation Day, I didn't know, um, or she didn't know, it was just a freak, a freak accident that we, we were there at the same time as, as it was Liberation Day, it was just unbelievable, to, you know, to see the survivors and whatever, but yeah, so for me mate, normally best, Auschwitz, wow, just pff, unbelievable mate. So now you've changed the name of your channel. The military biker uh are you got any plans on changing the actual channel itself on what you do and how you're going to do things or you know will you bring more of your military into the channel which i think it would be really interesting to be honest mate it you know fascinates me absolutely fascinates me so do i plan on doing anything else with the channel um differently from what i've done now it if i'm honest mate i'll probably just keep things rolling as they have been um I don't think I'm going to go mental with the live streams over winter again. Uh, obviously, last year, you know, over winter when COVID hit, there was not much we could do apart from go live streaming on a Friday night and getting absolutely drunk, legless, <laughs> um, which 
<laughs> you know, contributed to my view view time, which was which was awesome. But um, let's open that up. I don't think that my um, my time spent live streaming over the winter this winter, which is you know coming very soon here in Canada, um, will spend will be will be spent Friday night live streaming, just waffling and getting drunk. If I'm honest, that's what it was. Uh, apart from the channels, you may not know live streams, um, but they were pretty cool. And you were on the first one, bud. You were on the first one. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I, would I add some military stuff into it? Possibly. I've only got 15 months left uh, in the army, so I have done some stuff but I can only I'm limited as to what I can do because of rules and stuff like that so I have got some stuff in the pipeline which may be released after I'm out possibly um, just for security reasons should we say um, but yeah I'd, I think I'd like to do some more you know on the bike telling stories about like D-Day and 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 uh, the Battle of Britain and, and stuff like that and you know and I did that with uh, what was it VE Day so Victor in Europe Day, I did that with Victor in Europe Day. Um, I don't know if you can put the, the link to it up here, mate, or what, but yeah, I did that. I just drove the bike uh, and just waffled about, you know, Herman Goering trying to trying to uh, surrender to the Allies and you know all that sort of stuff. So yeah, <laughs> I'd like to, I'd like to do stuff like that because I like to think that I'm pretty well knowledgeable about about World War Two stuff. So um, but yeah, t probably keep it round about the same. Maybe add more of that type of stuff in, mate. But again, you know, winter's hitting soon over here. I've probably got at least. <laughs> I'm going to say a month, if I'm lucky, uh, till the snow hits. I mean, it's 20 degrees today. This time last year, there was six foot of snow on the floor, which that's how bad, how mental this country is. Um, but, you know, I'm lucky. We're still 20 degrees in the beginning of October, uh, in the September, beginning of October, so I'm more than happy. But, like, literally, in a month, month and a half, two months, mate, it'll be down to minus 40, and I'll be like, oh, my God. <laughs> so I might do some military stuff when, you know, over the winter, not on the bike. And my last question, mate. So you're a scouser in Canada in the army. So can you just explain to people who don't know, what is a scouser? What's a scouser? And what are you doing in Canada? Why are you in Canada? Why have you gone there? Or why did you choose to go there? <laughs> Come on, mate. Everyone knows what a scouser is. <laughs> Except in North America, obviously. So it's yeah. Um, so Scouser is basically somebody from Liverpool in the UK, uh, and I think the word Scouser or Scouse comes from like Liverpool being a port town. Um, and years and years and years and years and years ago, when you know Vikings and stuff, <laughs> that they would actually call it. They, they made like stew and stuff like that. It was actually called Lob Scouse. I think that the Vikings called it. And for whatever reason, uh, we make a stew similar that's called Scouse. Now, it's probably got its origins, uh, origins, <laughs> origins with that original, uh, you know, saying or name. But yeah, I believe that's where it comes from. So you get, you know, you get two types of Scouser. You get an Evertonian Scouser and a Liverpool Scouser. Everton being a club. And Liverpool being a football club, uh, just so happens that I am from the the red side of the city, Liverpool. Live and I support Liverpool Football Club. So when you hear me say you'll never walk alone in my video, that's why. Basically, I first came to Canada with the army in 1999, right? And we went out. We did everything. We, you know, as close as the, the, the training facility that we've got here is the closest you could get to going to war without actually going to war. That's why we come all the way over here. It's, it's as big as Wales. The training uh, area here is as big as Wales, and that's why we use it for armoured warfare. And obviously being a tank guy, um, I used to come out here every two to three years, depending on you know, depending on what size battle group it was and stuff. So yeah, every two to three years I would have been out here. But I first came out in 99, um, and after we spent a month living off the tank, uh, a month and a half, I think it was at that time. It was called an exercise called the Medicine Man back then. Um, after spending some time doing that, once we'd handed the, the vehicles back to uh, the owners, the British Army Training Unit, Suffield or Battis, uh here where I now work, uh, after, we changed, after we'd handed the vehicles back, uh, the Sergeant Major said, Right, lads, nice one for all the hard work. Well done, you've worked your, your sack off, as it were. Uh, You've got a week and a, a week and two days till your flight back to Germany. 
crack on. And we were like, what do you mean crack on? He went, I don't want to see it till then. So I was like, shit. So we literally got a taxi downtown, uh, which is 40 minutes away from the nearest town, by the way. This is the town that I'm talking about. Uh, the base to here is 40 minutes. Um, and I used to spend like, it used to get bloody, it used to feel like an eternity, man. It used to feel like an eternity, especially when you got on the, on the lash for a beer. But anyway, uh, he said, yeah, I don't want to see you for a week and two days. I was like, brilliant, where can we go? Um, so me and me and four lads literally hired a car uh, and we frigged off on a big massive road trip from here right the way over to Vancouver through the Rocky Mountains, like literally through the Rocky Mountains. Uh, went over to Vancouver, stayed there for a couple of nights. That was epic. Uh, we then got the ferry across to Victoria, which is an island, which is called, which is the capital of Vancouver Island. Uh, again, that was just unbelievable. And then we got the ferry down to Seattle uh, over in the States. You can get a ferry from Victoria over to Seattle. Um, and yeah, we spent a few days in Seattle and that was just unbelievable. You know when you go somewhere and you remember it for the rest of your life? That was that road trip for me and it was spectacular. I mean, especially with the lads that I went with all, you know, outstanding boys. Um, all long gone now, out the army and stuff. So, but yeah, um, that, I fell in love with the country, you know, 20 years ago, 21 years ago. And I, I, said, to, I said to myself, if I ever get a chance to come back here as, as permanent staff, then you know, I'd love to take that opportunity to do so. And it just so happened that in 2015, uh, my boss said to me at the time, he said, there's a job come up in, in Bass, do you want it? I was like, uh, instantly I went, yeah. <laughs> he didn't even have to tell me what it was, yep. But then I had to go home and explain to the wife that uh, we were leaving Germany and, and possibly going to, to Canada. And you can imagine how that conversation went. Yeah, yeah, exactly mate, exactly. So she came round in the end um, and to be honest it was one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. Why? Because both myself and the missus absolutely adore this place, um, love it. Not the city itself but Canada, um, when, we, when we get out in 15 months we're going towards the Rockies uh, to settle. But. Um, yeah, Canada, it's such an amazing place. We've done an unbelievable amount of traveling. I mean, Christ, I drove down from here, from Southern Alberta, right the way down to LA. We did San Fran, we did LA, we did uh, Vegas a few times. I flew down to Vegas. I mean, check this out, man. It cost me 60 American dollars return to fly to Vegas. How awesome is that? <laughs> I know, mate, I know. You can't complain at that, bud. You just need your spend. Um, so, so yeah, that's that. You know, we came here five years ago, uh, and I've been lucky enough to to stay, and I will be staying. I've got you know a permanent residency for me and my family now. Um, and the boy absolutely loves uh, ice hockey. Talk to it like you know duck on water. Absolutely loves it. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, I, I won't. I don't plan on coming back to the UK anytime soon. But I will have to uh, to do my resettlement and stuff like that. Because like I said, I'm a, I'm a civvy in 15 months, man. That's me into the big, big bad world of, of civilian Straza. Um, yeah, <laughs> when that comes, you know, life will change slightly. So, but yeah, you know, I've set myself up, and, and I've always said that I'd love to live here. And you know, I'm, I'm happy that to say that I can't actually do that now. Um, you know, so it, it's been really cool, mate. Uh, but yeah, that's why. Um, like I say, in 15 months, I'll retire. I've become a Canadian, eh? As they say. <laughs> Oh dear. Tell you what mate, that was absolutely fantastic that I was talking to you. I really enjoyed that. Some nice questions there. Yeah, mate, your answer, you, I loved your answers as well, Paul. Definitely, definitely cool answers. Yeah, really enjoyed it mate, it was brilliant. So, you got any plans of uh, coming back to the UK anytime soon? It's been fantastic to meet up mate. You know, have a couple of beers, go out for a ride. That sounds cracking mate, honestly. I'd, I'd, when I get back to the UK, Paul, uh, yeah, definitely, mate. You're on for a pint, and uh, you know if I've got a bike, I'll go and hire one. Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure. We'll have to do this more often, mate. But yeah, mate. Thanks very much for you know for doing this. Um, yeah, you're right. It, it is a good having the old telepathy thing is very cool. I think we should do some more. Look at that. Wow, telepathy. Um, you know, next year maybe. See if my telepathy antenna still works. Keep yourself safe, mate. Out the channel, 
and the new channel name does amazing things for you. You fully deserve it, mate. And uh, we'll have to do this more often, mate. Keep in touch. We'll make some more collaboration videos together. Anyhow, military biker, you take care, mate. Look after yourself. Mav, take it easy, pal. It's been a pleasure. And everybody watching, thanks very much for watching. Uh, we both hope you've enjoyed this. Something different. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and if you don't know who I am, now you do. So from me, Maverick and Motorev, this is me signing off. Oosh! Be good, mate. Take it easy. I'll see you on the dark side. Peace out from me. I am the military biker. And remember, you'll never walk alone. Mate, just off the record while we're here, just want to show you some of these houses down this road, man. Jesus Christ! Check this. This is uh, the posh end of town. As you can see, it's like it's like home alone down here, man. I'm home alone. But yeah, look at some of these houses, mate. They're just huge. I'm waiting to see this one right now. Look at that. Look at that! <laughs> it's mental! Anyway, pal, have fun uh, editing. <laughs> Can't wait to see this, mate. It's going to be outstanding. I really, really can't. Um, good luck, pal. You, you put some. I'm, I'm guarantee you'll put some funny twerks in there as well. Uh, but mate, this has been brilliant. Let's do it again sometime soon, mate. All right. Off the record, all of this, by the way. <laughs> Unless you want to use it, it's up to you. But yeah, mate. Take it easy, pal. Hope, uh, hope UK life treating you well, mate. And I'll, uh, I'll speak to you soon, pal. Take it easy.